you manage the labor. So whether you are wanting a uh, medicated birth and planning to get an epidural or whether you aren't, I'm there to help you with that. And there are all kinds of things that I do with positioning and um, like, of course, music is one of my favorites. Um, and we've, un and mu music does have a physiological effect on the body. Like you were, you were mentioning, and I definitely see that in birth. Um, I also like to use acupressure on people and, um, helping with positioning and some other techniques. It's, it's like having the person in the room that eats, sleeps and breathes birth so that you don't have to, but you have that wealth of knowledge as a resource for you. Uh, doulas do not advocate for you. They don't tell the team what you're looking for or what you're wanting, but they can help with the conversation. So I might um, just bring up a point that, oh, hey, this, this thing that you're talking about right now, that might have implications on this other thing that you were thinking of, of later. And, you know, just kind of opening that awareness because I have a wider scope sometimes than the people I'm thinking, especially if you're in the hospital, you know, you have a nurse that you just met that day that doesn't maybe hasn't even read your birth plan and doesn't understand that, you know, if you want delayed cord clamping, maybe you shouldn't sign that form to donate the cord blood, <laughs> you know, um, just kind of helping people understand that. And then reminding that my clients that they have the opportunity to take space and to ask questions. And, and so it's really kind of propping or holding them up because I'm, I'm in, I'm in their corner. Not that the, anybody else isn't, but understanding and knowing them better. It, it gives me a different distinct place to be in, to offer diff different help for them. That's great. I think, I mean, it's really very complicated. I know I've, I've been there. I actually had my three children in the United States. So um, there's a lot of decisions that were just made for me that I didn't fully understand. I did have a midwife for my first birth. And, um, you know, and she, it was, it was pretty good. Um, I don't know why I didn't have it for the second one, but I, in any case, there were things that were happening that I wasn't aware of, but I, mm -hmm. I did, I did always emphasize that I wanted the least amount of medication as possible. And I wanted it to be as natural as possible. And I, yeah. I, just, I think I need to, you know, I just want to emphasize that because I know people, I, I know people have had children and they're always asking me like, they're in shock that I even had a vaginal birth. You know, they're like, mm -hmm. wow, you know, you, you didn't have an epidural, like you didn't have a C-section. And I was like, <laughs> I was totally against all of that. Um, mm -hmm. But that was just my personal decision. You know, I don't, I don't judge anyone else for what they decide to do. Um, yeah, but, our histories absolutely play a role in that. And people who have similar histories can go totally different ways. So a person with, you know, some kind of abuse or trauma might choose to have an epidural or a c-section because they can't because that would make that's what makes them feel safest and most powerful and person with a similar on paper obviously it's not going to be exactly same but a similar background might choose to birth at home because that's where they feel safest and most powerful and i also just wanted to mention that we also have to remember that providers even with the same letters behind their name can practice very very differently and um you know, you can get a wide range of midwives, you can get a wide range of OBs. And so there's, of course, some space in the middle where you can get care like a midwife with an OB who's really interested in that. But if that's what you want, you need to know it and you need to find that person that can do that for you. Yeah, so it sounds like you, um, you need to really think about all these options before um, actually giving birth. I mean, you have plenty of time, but, um, and, and uh, it's great that more as a, a great resource, uh, as, as you're hearing right now for any of you that are just even thinking about it and just want to explore the options, even if you're pregnant or not pregnant, I don't, I don't think it really matters. I think it really just matters. What's your intention mm -hmm. and to, to find out how to do that. Um, I wanted to just talk about, I know we're kind of running out of time, but I wanted to know, but you talked about, um, birth uh, and the ideal birth and what does that mean to have an ideal birth is everyone's ideal different like what's your definition of an ideal birth yeah I my definition of an ideal birth or a best birth is the birth that you have consciously chosen at some level as well as had the best chances for it. I mean, of course it has to be different for different people because we throw around the term safe and healthy to a lot of people, as long as the baby's safe and healthy. And it, it does several things. I mean, it's, 
sometimes at best intended to be a, a way for people to get perspective, but it can be very um, not validating to somebody who's had a birth trauma. You know, what do you have to complain about? Your baby's safe and healthy. But if you've gone through this traumatic experience and you're dealing with the emotions, then that could shut you down and think, oh, I have no, re I have no reason to complain, so why should I seek help? You know, but, but we know that there are a lot of people, I mean, one third of families will call their, their births a traumatic experience and you can't have that. I mean, you can have, you can have symptoms or full blown PTSD from your birth experience, which is unfortunate to know that that's true. Um, but then we also have to remember that there are families who go through pregnancies knowing that they're, they're not going to have what's traditionally accepted as safe and healthy. You know, there are families who go through pregnancies knowing that their baby may not survive the pregnancy or their birth, or that their baby is not going to be born neurotypical, or they may have fears for their for the health of the pregnant person. There might be some complications around that. And so then what do those people have? Well, those people, we all deserve a need to feel safe. We all deserve a need to feel well supported. We all deserve and need to feel like our voices are heard, that we have the choices and that we were able and had the information to make, to give informed consent as well as informed refusal and that that is respected. And so I think really when we're talking about an ideal birth, it is those pieces being in place. Um, I wanted to share something with you and probably this was, um, you know, a universe intention for me. <laughs> but a friend of mine shared a book with me that um, I just started reading this week and it's about different, it's actually a book of different women and their paths in life. It's a, like a, a co-authored book. And um, there was a, a piece about a woman who was pregnant twice and she lost both babies at around 20, between 21 and 25 weeks. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, and she's a warrior and, she, and, and her experience, her post-traumatic experience, how much she wanted to be a mother and mm -hmm. how much she wanted that baby. And even when there were complications, the baby was surviving the babies, you know, she had a heartbeat. And, uh, you know, I just want to pay tribute to women like that. Anyone who's listening and, you know, they're, they're working on, uh, creating a child with their partner or how or even as a single mom, whatever your mm -hmm. situation is, you know, I, I just want to honor you if you're listening because it's, it's, it's really so important. Some of us, I mean, I, I personally didn't have any issues um, carrying or uh, conceiving a child. And, um, and, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, we don't know everybody's journey. We don't mm -hmm. know everybody's situation. And I, I just, I'm reaching out to everyone to just tell you that I think that, as a woman, I just feel for everyone. I just feel like, you no, know, we never know all, all the stories. And, you know, it really hit me when I was reading that piece by her because she was like, well, I was in the hospital, you know, in the maternity ward. And, and there were a few women who lost their babies too, but there were many that had them. Mm -hmm. and how she felt there. And I was just, it just kind of broke my heart. I was just like, whoa, you know, that just really hit me. Like, yeah, that that's happening. And how do we, you know, how can we support women like that? And um, I don't know, I just felt called to, to share that. Um, for yeah. You. And what was that book? Uh, I'll have to, I'll have to, I'll put it in the notes. <laughs> I don't have it in front of me. You weren't expecting it to come up. It, yeah. It's Ignite the Warrior, I think, but it's, uh, I'll, um, I'll have the, I'll have it in the notes for people if they're interested. Yeah, absolutely. There are people out there who have to make decisions that some of us cannot even imagine or they go through things that cannot even imagine and before I was working in birth I was working with families who had children with developmental disabilities and and adults as well and it seriously was just you know to hear some of those parents share oh I went to work and my coworker was complaining about their son messing up and in soccer practice or in a soccer game and she was like what are you she's like you don't even know because her son was just learning to throw a ball forward, you know, and same age. And, and she's just, just like, it's a, to, to live in a totally different world that people, yeah, don't know. And, and I, I said, once you have your baby, you can't unhave your baby. I don't, I think that even when you're pregnant, you know, that expecting that baby that you don't un. Uh, you, you're a parent already, you know, you're not, regardless of what happens from that point on, you can't un, 
unchange that shift. Right. And, and, and then also just being um, sensitive, you know, around not only our words, but also sensitive around our culture. I had a friend uh, who lives in Finland and they were having experiences kind of like that. And I remember saying something intending for it to be comforting, but that was not appropriate for their culture. And so I got to learn about their culture uh, but it was also just one of my moments before I really learned about how to talk to people in a more open way uh, that that I, I really got to see, oh gosh, this is this is different for her because of her of the country she lives in and not right or wrong. Right. And I did want to point something else out. I met somebody recently at, a, at um, something at an event that I had gone to and um, I, I don't. I don't know how to put this. Um, so this woman shared with us that because when she was born, the umbilical cord was around her neck. Mm -hmm. She had trauma from that, that she didn't quite realize until much later on in her life. And it just, kind of, it also was like another, like, wow, that just hit me. Like, <laughs> like, you know, I, I'm not sure why I made the decisions I made and I don't know, you know, like, if I had had a natural birth and then some, there was a complication, of course, I would have said, you know, do whatever is necessary for my baby to survive. Sure. Um, but um, I just wanted to bring up the point that it's, it's not only our intention. You know, I believe that our desire comes from what we, you know, from the universe or from source or, or within our own self, knowing we have this knowing about what's happening, you know, and, mm -hmm. and personally I had, I had an issue with one of my children when, um, when I was, when they were uh, in, in a fetus in the, and nobody detected anything, but I knew mm -hmm. something was not right, you know, and, and it, was, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was corrected. But mm -hmm. uh, I have to just mention that. I think you, you talked about intuition, your inner intuition. And, you know, it's been part of my, my own message to, uh, for, my, um, for my audience that to trust it, you know, even yes. if you're not, no one's showing you, everything's looking good on the ultrasound and you're still feeling something is, a little bit off and you don't you may not know until it's done you know until the baby comes out but trust it and also remember that everything is beautiful like everything is there for a purpose and you know there is I really don't believe in any normalcy like <laughs> what does that mean to have a normal both or what does that mean to have a normal child you know the same struggles that that person who's had who's you know dealing with a soccer child has different struggles you know it's sure it's relative <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, there's actually two things coming up for me uh, as you're sharing that. Firstly, there is a lot of evidence and research going into the pre and perinatal psychology of children. And, and um, there's an association called the Association for Pre and Perinatal Psychology and Health. Um, and they just have journals upon journals upon journals where they are looking into what do we remember at birth? from our birth? What do we remember before birth and the consciousness that's there beforehand? And that is just incredible to think about, um, you know, things that bother you right now might be related to a birth memory. And, 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 and also just thinking about people that are still told, oh, those, those smiles are just gas. It's like, no, your baby's having real emotions. <laughs> your baby's are just smiling and sleep. Great. How sweet. But I don't know. I don't make that face when I have gas. <laughs> you know, like, um, that, that sometimes we can, we can um, you know, not value or not respect uh, children to a certain age, and and also kind of almost treat them like like they don't know what they're talking about when they very well do know what they're talking about. Um, I lost the other <laughs> note that I had. I thought the <laughs> let's see, you were talking about intuition. Interesting that and yeah, um, uh, there are so many stories. I mean, so many stories about about people who are pregnant knowing knowing something that's not showing up on a. Oh, here is what it was. But there is there can be so much fear mongering around birth that you know a very popular birth book about expecting what you're expecting um, that. Book, I, I feel is a very fear-mongering book because each chapter tells you, well, if your child has this, this is what the week that it'll show up, you know? And so I, every month you're like, oh my gosh, does my child have this? Right, and it just right. cultivates that. So I think also having some tools to 
understand, like to just make a distinction between is this intuition or is this fear? 